Hi and welcome, I'm Gavin Lon. So this is the fourth part in a series of videos dedicated to building a shopping cart application on .NET 6 using Blazor WebAssembly and Web API. We have now created our first workflow which involves retrieving product data from the database and displaying the data to the user in an aesthetically pleasing style. We have built our database using Entity Framework Core. We have implemented code using the repository design pattern within a web API component in order to return product data from our database to a calling client. In the last part of this series, part three, we implemented code for our Blazor WebAssembly component to call an appropriate action method within our web API component using a HTTP GET request in order to retrieve product data from the server and display the data to the user in an aesthetically pleasing style. For content like this and much more, please consider subscribing. And please ring the bell so as to be notified of future content. If you like this video, please hit the like button and please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content. If you'd like to thank me by buying me a coffee, I've included a link to my Buy Me A Coffee webpage. Any support is of course greatly appreciated. So let's move on to the next workflow. We want to create functionality to retrieve data for a specific product from the server and display the details of that product to the user. So when the user clicks on a particular product, only the details for that specific product are displayed to the user. The user can then decide whether or not to add the product to the user's shopping cart. A button will be provided within the Razor component responsible for displaying the relevant product's details, whereby a user can click this button and add the relevant product to the user's shopping cart. We'll implement the code for the Add to Cart button in the next tutorial. So let's go to the Web API component. Let's open the Product Repository class and go to the Get Item method. You can see that currently we have a default implementation for this method, which was created when we generated the code stubs through Visual Studio of the iProduct repository interface that we are implementing in the product repository class. So as the name implies, the getItem method returns data regarding a single item. So we can use the find async method to retrieve the data pertaining to the product that matches the ID value passed into the get item method through code like this. The next step is to expose the functionality to a calling client by implementing code that gets executed in reaction to an appropriate HTTP get request. So we want the get item functionality to execute when a calling client makes an appropriate HTTP get request for product data that can be identified in the system with the ID value passed to our Web API component from the calling client. We can implement code that creates an appropriate HTTP response through creating an action method within our product controller controller class. So let's create a method within the product controller class to return data for a particular product. To speed things up, Let's duplicate the getItemsAction method that we created in the second part of this series and change the code appropriately so as to implement the functionality for the getItemAction method. We only want to return data for one object of type ProductDTO rather than an IEnumerable collection of objects of type ProductDTO to the calling client. So let's change the return type appropriately. Let's include a parameter named ID, which is of type integer. This ID parameter denotes the ID value of the product data for which the client wishes to have returned from our Web API component. Within the HTTP GET attribute, let's include the appropriate root template information. Our GET item action method contains a parameter of type integer named ID. So for the GET item action method, it is appropriate to pass in an argument of type string to its corresponding HTTP get attribute that denotes the appropriate root template for this action method. 
So let's use the product repository object passed into our controller class via dependency injection to call the getItem method that we have just implemented within the product repository class. So if the returned value is null, this means that the resource does not exist. So let's pass a response to the calling client that includes a bad request status code. We can do this in code by returning the result returned from the bad request method like this. So let's say we also want to include the name of the category under which the relevant product falls in the returned object. As we know, we only have the ID of the category under which the returned product falls within the product entity. We don't have the facility to store any other information pertaining to the product's category within the product entity. So we need to write code to get the category information from the product category entity. We can then include the product information and the category information in an object of type product DTO and return the relevant object of type product DTO to the calling client. So let's implement code for the get category method within the product repository class to retrieve data for our specific category based on the category ID passed into this method. Let's then write code within our getItemAction method to appropriately call the getCategory method on the object of type iProductRepository, like this. The next step is to write the code that merges the data pertaining to a specific product with the data pertaining to the relevant product's category into one object of type ProductDTO. In order to write the code for this in a clean way, we can create a convert to DTO extension method overload within our DTO conversions class. So the convert to DTO extension method currently within our DTO conversions class converts a collection of products and a collection of product categories appropriately into a collection of objects of type product DTO and returns the collection of objects of type product DTO to the calling code. We want our new convert to DTO extension method overload to convert one object of type product and related object of type product category into one object of type product DTO and return this object of type product DTO to the calling code. This is basically so that we can include the relevant product data and the category name within one object. Our product DTO type facilitates this. So we can write code to perform the relevant conversion like this. We can now go to our getItemAction method and call the ConvertToDTO extension method, which is now available on this object of type product, to return the appropriate object of type product DTO to our action method. We can then write code to return a HTTP status code of 200, OK, along with the relevant object of type product DTO to the calling client by appropriately returning the result of the OK method and passing in the appropriate object of type product DTO to the OK method. If an exception occurs for some reason during the execution of the getItemAction method, we have code here that will return a HTTP status code of 500, denoting an internal server error, to the calling client along with an appropriate error message. Great. So let's write code within the Blazor component to make an appropriate 
HTTP call to the server side code that we have just implemented. So let's open our iProduct service interface. Let's include a method definition for a method where we will implement the code to call the getItemAction method on the server. We want this getItem method to run asynchronously, so we are returning a task object. The getItem method is returning a value, so we must pass the return type as a type argument to the generic task type here. This method contains a parameter of type integer and is named id. This id parameter denotes the id value that is used to identify a specific product. So let's implement the getItem method in the product service class. Let's generate a try catch block. In the previous part of this series, part 3, we implemented code for the getItems method that uses the HTTP client object's get from JSON async method to call the relevant server side action method. This method calls the relevant action method but also handles translating the returned JSON data into the appropriate object type. I'm going to use the get async method to call the relevant action method in our get item method. This method doesn't convert the returned JSON data to the appropriate object type. We need to write code for this separately. We'll do that in a bit. The get async method returns a HTTP response object. So we can use the returned object to first ascertain as to whether our HTTP request to the server was successful. So this code checks that the relevant status code falls within the success range. So if the call is successful, we want code to execute that checks if our HTTP request has returned a response with content. If there is no content returned from the server, we want code executed that returns the default value associated with the product DTO type, like this. So the c -sharp default value for a user-defined type, which is a reference type, will be null. So this is just the way I'm choosing to handle the scenario where the call to the server is successful but for some reason no data is returned from the server. So when the call is successful and content is returned from the server, we want code to execute that translates the JSON data returned from the server into an object of the appropriate type. Else, if the call to the server is not successful, we want code to execute that handles the exception. So here we are just going to throw the exception at this point. And we can pass the message sent back from the server as an argument to the exception object, like this. Within the catch block, we could implement code to log the exception or handle the exception in an appropriate manner that we choose. Let's implement appropriate code within the getItems method to also include exception handling functionality.
So let's create a racer component within the pages folder. Let's name this component productdetails.razor. So this is the component where we'll implement the code to display details regarding a specific product. Let's create the base class for our product details component and let's name this component product details base. Let's implement the code for our product details base class. We want the ID parameter that denotes the identifier for a specific product to be passed into the component. So let's create a parameter named ID that is of type integer. We need to decorate this property with the parameter attribute. We also need to ensure that our base class inherits from the component base class. So we want an object of type iProductService to be injected into our product details component. So we can do this by including a property within our base class of type iProductService and decorate the relevant property with the inject attribute. Let's include a property of type product DTO within our base class and let's name this property product. Let's include a string property to store an exception message. So we want code to execute when our Blazor component is first invoked, so we can ensure that this happens by writing the relevant code within a method that overrides the oninitialized async method. To generate the appropriate oninitialized async method, let's type in override, followed by pressing the space bar, and then let's select the appropriate method from the list presented to us. Let's generate a try catch block. Within the try catch block, let's appropriately call the get item method on the injected object of type iProductService. The returned value is assigned to our product property, which we can then access from our productdetails.razor file. If an exception occurs, we want the exception message to be assigned to the error message property. Let's implement code to output details regarding the relevant product. So let's ensure that we include the appropriate root template at the top of the file. We can use the page directive for this purpose and notice how we are including the ID parameter here. This is because an appropriate ID parameter must be passed to this razor component when this razor component is invoked. Let's write the code logic. So while the product property is null and the error message property is null, we want a loading indicator to be displayed to the user. Else, if an error occurs, in which case the error message property will not be null, we want the error message to be displayed. Please note that for the sake of this example, we are writing functionality to display the error message returned from the server to the screen. In a complete application, it would be more appropriate to output a user-friendly non-technical error message to the user and log the actual error message returned from the server. Else, we want to output the details of the relevant product in an aesthetically pleasing style to the user 
And of course, Bootstrap 5 classes are being used here to output the data in an aesthetically pleasing style. Great. Then let's go to the display products.razor file and include the appropriate value for the href attribute within the anchor tag that wraps the cards that represent the products sold in our online store. So we want this link to invoke the product details razor component. We need to include the appropriate ID value denoting the identifier for a specific product within our href attribute value here. Let's run the code. Great. Let's abstract the code that outputs an exception to the user in its own razor component so that we can reuse this component from within multiple parent Razor components. This is also a cleaner way of implementing the code that displays an error message to the user. Let's write code to force an exception to occur. So we know that a product with an ID of 1000 does not exist in the system. So in this case, the server will send back a response code indicating that a bad request has been made. Let's run the code. Great. Lastly, it would be better in terms of a user's UX if an appropriate animated loading indicator was displayed to the user while the user is waiting for data to be displayed. So, if we navigate to this site here, please find a link to this site below in the description. We can copy the relevant HTML and CSS code for an animated loading indicator of our choice. These loading indicators here can be used within our application free of charge. So let's select this one. Let's copy the HTML and the CSS code for the loading indicator of our choice and integrate the code within our application. The cleanest way to integrate this code into our applications in my opinion, is to abstract the loading indicator code within a Razor component. As discussed in the previous part of this series, part three, we are able to create a CSS file that only applies to its corresponding Razor component by naming the relevant CSS file in a way that adheres to a specific naming convention. So if the name of the Razor component is display spinner, we can create a CSS file that will only apply to this Razor component by naming the relevant CSS file display spinner.razor.css. I could then call the display spinner Razor component from relevant parent Razor components. So we can now reuse the spinner functionality for multiple parent components. <laughs> 
If you do struggle to get the spinner functionality working, you can ensure that it does work by including the relevant CSS code within style tags in the index.html file, or by including the relevant CSS code within the app.css file. However, I do believe that it is cleaner to include the relevant CSS code for the spinner within its own CSS class that only pertains to the relevant Razor component. I hope you enjoyed this video. I look forward to presenting the next video in this series where we'll create the functionality for adding products to a shopping cart. For content like this and much more, please consider subscribing and please ring the bell so as to be notified of future content. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content. If you'd like to thank me by buying me a coffee, I've included a link to my Buy Me A Coffee webpage. I've also included a PayPal Me link that you can use to support the channel via PayPal. Any support is of course greatly appreciated. A special thank you to those who have been kind enough to support the channel. It is greatly appreciated. I really enjoy engaging with you in the comments section, so please feel free to leave me a comment. The latest code can be found on GitHub. A link to the relevant repository has been included below in the description. Thank you and take care.